Good morning, everyone. And since this is the first time that we meet, uh, I would like to start by introducing myself. My name is Matteo Giantomassi from uh, the Université Catholique de Louvain in Belgium, where I work in collaboration with Gianmarco and Xavier Gonz. I'm a physicist, but I spend most of my time uh, doing software development, uh, in particular uh, in Fortran with Ab Abinit, and I'm also the author of the Abipy package, the, the Python package we use to post-process Abinit calculations and automate uh, Ab Initio workflows. And I contributed to the GW code during my PhD. In particular, uh, I've implemented the MPI parallelism, the integration with the PW method, the use of symmetries. And in the past three or four years, uh, I've been really working on uh, electron phonon calculations. So obviously in this school, we mainly focus on electron and electron interaction, but I would like to mention that in the new version, mm -hmm of Abinit is also possible to compute the contribution to the electron energy due to the interaction with phonons. And this is rather interesting because it leads to a uh, Banachar effect due to phonon accumulation. So there's an additional contribution to the quasi-particle energies and electron phonon interaction is also crucial for computing the transport properties or superconducting properties in metals. But obviously this is not something that we are gonna discuss in uh, in my talk, indeed, the title is, uh, uh, of my contribution is GW in practice with Abinit. So the main goal is to discuss the um, technical aspects of the internal implementation as all the theoretical background, the mm -hmm. physical uh, intuition has been already discussed by the other Matteo in the previous talk. So let me start by just connecting my talk with the Matteo's uh, discussion. So very briefly, we know very well that if you use Konechan theory with approximately the exchange correlation functional such as LDA and GGA, the ab initio band gaps are systematically underestimated with respect to uh, experiments. We have seen that many body perturbation theory and Edin's equation provide a rigorous approach to study uh, charged excitation energies or neutral excitation energies. Unfortunately, Edin's equations are extremely difficult to solve, much more difficult than Konishan. Uh, That's the reason why we usually employ a simplified version in which we approximate the vertex function gamma with an object that is uh, local uh, in space and instantaneous in time, and this leads to the so-called GW approximation. GW is much easier to solve than the full set of Edin's equation, still much more complex than Konishan. We don't solve the GW equations except consistently. We usually use the so-called one-shot or G0, W0 method, which we just perform one iteration of the, 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 the GW diagram. G0, W0 is much better than LDA or GGA. Unfortunately, the initial results are still underestimated with respect to the experiments. So there's really a lot of discussion in the literature related to the, the starting point, vertex corrections, vertex corrections, the fact that one should also include some kind of self-consistency. And the last but not least, there are also other effects due to uh, electron phonon interaction. Okay, these diagrams uh, cartoon here compares uh, the Konechan DFT band structure with the GW that usually leads to an opening of the ab initio uh, band gap. And then, as already mentioned, if we want to compute accurate optical properties, then we need to go beyond and include electronal interaction, but this will be discussed by Francesco uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, a quick summary of the main capabilities of the code. We formulate the GW equation in Fourier space, so reciprocal space G and frequency at zero Kelvin. We support non-conserving the potentials as well as PW, although at present I would recommend the non-conserving approach because it's more stable. For PW, one should use uh, uh, specialized pseudo potentials that unfortunately are not yet available. We support semiconductors, metals, we can include the uh, polarization, magnetization of the system. At the level of uh, the computation of the polarizability, there are two different approaches, uh, Adler Weiser and the Hilbert transform. I, I, I will discuss this topic in more detail in the next slides. 
different approximations for the self-energy are available, RT4 with Kansham, obviously we have GW and other flavors for the self-energy. Uh, we can compute the convolution in frequency space, defining the self-energy using two different methods. We have the plasma pole approximation uh, that is fast, although um, approximated. And if you want to improve the accuracy of your computation, then you can also perform this uh, numerical integration using either the contour deformation or the analytic continuation. There are different levels of self-consistency. Obviously, you can do one-shot GW, but it is also possible to update uh, the eigenvalues or the wave functions either in G or in the skin interaction. The code is parallelized with the NPI and the memory is distributed over bands. Okay, this is a typical uh, uh, flowchart a typical calculation with the adding it that roughly speaking consists of three different steps. In the first part, we generate a wave function file with the Konesham orbitals, usually by performing a non-self-consistent calculation. In the second step that is associated to opt driver three, we read the orbitals from the wave function file, we construct the polarizability, and once we have kind out we build the, the, the electric matrix epsilon, we invert it, and we save the results to file. At this point, we can enter the last part, the, the sigma uh, code, in which, again, we read the Konesham orbitals from the wave function file, we read the screening produced in the previous step, and we build the, metric, the matrix elements of the self-energy operator. At this point, we can compute the quasi-particle uh, uh, wave functions and energies, and this completes the, a typical one-shot calculation. If you want to introduce the self-consistency effects, then you need to use the output uh, quasi-particle results as input of the screening part if you want to update the screening, or alternatively, you just fix the screening at the W0 level, so the Konesham uh, results, and you just update the G in the self-energy by using the quasi-particle results of the previous iteration, and then you iterate until self-consistency is reached. All these steps are connected through uh, files that are specified by these variables. There are two versions. Uh, the first one accepts the index of the data set if you want to have a single input file that performs all the calculation, or alternatively, you can specify the name of the external file using this file path version. Uh, there's also another important variable, GWCalc type, that defines the kind of uh, uh, self-consistency mode and the approximation we want to use. Uh, yes. Can you give? I see that there's a question. Well, I would prefer to postpone the, the um, this discussion at the end of the talk, uh, also because I don't have any slides that are related to COSEX. Uh, okay, so I was discussing GW calc type, and uh, uh, this variable governs the choice between the different capabilities of the GW implementation. It consi consists of two digits, A and B. The first digit defines the self-consistency type. Uh, so we use zero for one shot, one if you want to update just the energies, and two if you want to compute also the quasi-particle amplitudes. The second digit, B, defines the expression for the self-energy and how to compute the frequency convolution. Now, in the documentation, all the different cases are well documented, and here I'm just reporting, reporting the most important cases. So B equal to zero corresponds to the plasma pole approximation. Then if you want to compute the frequency convolution numerically, then you can use one for the analytic continuation or two for the contour deformation. Uh, what is important to stress at this point is that there are a lot of default values. In particular, the default value of GW calc type is zero. So this means that uh, uh, the ability input file uh, by default computes one shot quasi-particle energies with the plasma pole approximation. So the, the, the set of variables that you have to specify is relatively small if you want to perform a one shot with plasma pole. If you want to go beyond this approximation, then obviously you have to specify more uh, um, input variables in your input file. 
but I, I have examples in which I show you the beyond this. Uh, as concerns the implementation and tutorials, uh, okay, you have all the lessons, uh, the lessons of this URL, and for the general there are three different tutorials. The W1 uh, discusses the implementation uh, of quasi particle energy in silicon with the plasma pore approximation. And I will suggest to start from this lesson during the hands on session. Uh, the second lesson is more advanced. It treats metal, aluminum, and shows how to compute the self energy and the spectral function using the contour deformation technique. Then there's also another lesson uh, in which we discuss some technical details related to the parallelism and how to use the Hilbert transform method that is much better than the Adler Weiser expression if you want to compute several frequencies. All the variables are documented there on the website. And I also suggest you to read these theory notes because we establish a connection between uh, uh, the equations and the, the internal implementation. So some of the, my slides are based yeah. on uh, this web page. Let me go back to my slides. Okay. Uh, then, for those of you who are really familiar with Abinit and uh, GW and they want to improve their productivity, I would suggest to look at the, the Abipy examples available at this URL. In particular, we have an advanced lesson in the form of a Jupyter notebook in which we show how to automate this calculation using this Python interface. So you don't write input files explicitly, but you have a Python, uh, a Python scripts that automate the different steps, including the, the submission, and uh, everything is uh, automatically split into independent tasks that can be executed in parallel. Uh, if you want to, let's say, use the standard approach in which you write your input files uh, manually. Uh, then you may want to look at this other notebook in which we show how to post-process the results by reading the results reported in the NetCDF files. And there are also other examples in the standard tutorial in which you use uh, the Abipy scripts to plot band structures or to print the, the results of the computation uh, to screen. Uh, okay. Then, before discussing the GW calculation in practice, uh, I would like to uh, remind you some basic uh, concepts related to plane waves, symmetries, uh, and brilliant zone sampling. Uh, okay, this is really basic stuff. It's essentially the block theorem that tells us that in a crystalline system, um, the eigenvalues of a single particle are Newtonian are written by a phase factor that depends on the wave vector and the periodic part. And this is the, the function that we expand in a plane wave that is set according to this equation. And then we truncate the basis set expansion by into introducing a cutoff energy cut. Uh, an important point that I would like to discuss here is the uh, convolution theorem, because in many parts of well, ground state, GW, and even electron phonon, we have to compute products of uh, functions in the real space. Uh, this is, uh, for example, the contribution to the density given by a particular band. Now, if you use the free expansion for the periodic part and you regroup the terms, what you get is that this density has three components uh, that are inside the sphere whose radius is twice the radius of the uh, wave function sphere. So if you expand the wave function with cutoff energy E cut, then the density will have a cutoff energy four times the uh, cutoff energy for the wave functions. Uh, this is due to the convolution theorem. Uh, internally, we don't sum over the, these G vectors inside the sphere because this will be extremely slow. We use the fast Fourier transform algorithm in which we need to define a box. So in order to treat the convolution exactly, we need a box that encloses the sphere for the density. So the take home message is that products in real space leads to a convolution. And then uh, if you want to treat exactly this convolution, then we have to increase the size of the FFT mesh. Uh, so far we discussed the expansion of the single particle orbitals, the periodic part, but in many body theory, we have to uh, represent two point functions. 
So I, I remind you that we stimulate infinite systems by enforcing the born von Kalman periodic boundary condition. So we have a supercell with this number of infinite cell along the three used directions. All our many body functions, when we formulate the um, Edens equation in real space, are defined in this born von Kalman supercell. We, we cannot restrict the description to the unit cell. Let me see. Oh, okay. Uh, And um, another important property is that since we are dealing with uh, a, an infinite system, all our two point functions uh, are invariant if we translate both spatial arguments, okay? And from the mathematical point of view, this equation leads to the following Fourier expansion. Note that when we expand a two point function in Fourier space, we have to sum over two plane wave indices, G1 and G2, and in this case, we can define a cutoff energy. Uh, but we also have an additional sum over Q points. So, and these Q points belong to a mesh inside the first Brillouin zone. And this mesh is dual to the Bonbon Kamen supercell. Uh, okay, just a couple of comments related to symmetries. Uh, we take advantage of the fact that the system is invariant under certain uh, um, uh, rotation and fractional translations to reduce the computation to a, a subset of the full Brillouin zone because eigenvalues and wave functions can be reconstructed at runtime from the irreducible wedge. And in Abinit, we call this number of K points in the IBG and KPT. And these symmetries are very important because the it can be exploited to reduce the memory requirements uh, and accelerate the calculation. Now, I see that, okay, it's 10.33, and we are supposed to have the coffee break. So, uh, I don't know, do you have any question or related to the slides that I've presented so far? Um, so, you, you said that in ability is possible to do uh, I don't know if you can hear. In Avenity, it's possible to do like uh, certain system GW or at least to do more cycles. And, but in the last uh, talk, we said that GW, we do just GW, you know, GW, baby. And I've read on different papers that it's not so convenient sometimes to do such system GW. So my question is, are there any cases in which it's better to do a self-consistent GW definition and it's worth it to spend a lot of time doing it? Well, uh, okay, good, good question. First of all, there are different recipes because uh, in the initial slide, I was also mentioning um, the quasi-particle self-consistent GW essentially constructs an effective Hamiltonian from the, the self-energy. But okay, you, you are right in the sense that according to the results uh, reported in the literature, self-consistent deteriorates the um, uh, quasi-particle properties. Actually, you get better results for to total energies. But as far as quasi-particle energies and also spectral uh, properties are concerned, yeah, it's not a good idea to perform a self-consistent GW. Uh, but there are cases in which people are trying to update, for example, the eigenvalues in the Green's function while keeping the screening fixed, and they observed some improvement with respect to G0, W0. So for sure, I will not go for a fully self-consistent GW because it is extremely expensive and doesn't make sense. People are trying to improve uh, the agreement with experiments by following different paths, for example, by using a different starting point. But this is also something that you should take into, uh, into account. Uh, uh, there are systems in which, for example, LDA predicts uh, a, a metallic behavior. So in this case, you have to use a different starting point. Thank you. Okay. So I think that we can stop uh, here and then we have this 30 minute coffee break and then we, we, we continue with the, the calculation of the wave function file. Okay. In the second part of my talk, I would like to discuss all the uh, different steps that are required to perform GW calculation. And we begin with the generation of the wave function file, including uh, empty state. So first of all, this is a, an expensive step because we need to include a lot of uh, unoccupied bands, 
So I, I would suggest to start immediately with a reasonably larger number of states. Usually we use a value that is greater than 10 times the number of occupied states. And once you have the wave function file, then you can immediately start to perform convergence studies. And if you find that the number of bands is not enough, then you go back to the first step, you generate a new wave function with a larger number of states. Actually, you can reread the previous wave function to initialize the orbitals, and this makes the calculation much faster. Here I have a typical uh, uh, data for uh, band structure transformation. You have already encountered these variables in the third lesson of the Arbinity tutorial. What I would like to stress here is that we usually change the default uh, values of some parameters when we have to include empty states. So first of all, we increase the number of iterations because the default value that should be 20 or 30 may not be enough when you have to uh, obtain um, empty states. Uh, and a very important point is that I strongly suggest you to include uh, a buffer. This variable here is used to exclude the last NVD buff states when we compute the maximum error, the maximum value of the residuals that give you, let's say, the, the, an, a proxy for the convergence of the eigenstates. Uh, and this convergence criterion is given by tall WFR. The reason why we use such a large number of states in this buffer is because high energy states converge very slowly. So you may need a lot of iteration just to converge the last states, but usually we don't need all the bands. So we use this buffer to accelerate the band structure calculation. And obviously you have to keep in mind that once you have the wave function file, only the first N band minus NBD buff states can be used because there's no guarantee that uh, all the states are converged with this given tolerance. Another point that I would like to make here is that when you generate the wave function file, you are automatically fixing the brilliant zone sampling that will be used in the other parts of the calculation. In particular, in Sigma, you can only compute quasi-particle corrections for the key points belonging to the mesh of the wave function file. So what I suggest is to start immediately by computing the Koneshan band structure to locate the position of the uh, CBM and the VBM. And according to these results, then you select uh, the variables defining the Brillouin zone sampling. If we take silicon, for example, we know that the, the, the top of the, uh, the balance is located at the gamma. So when you generate the wave function file, you want to have the gamma point. Uh, we also know that the bottom of the, the conduction is not located at the high symmetric point. And this means that since you are forced to use a mesh, the best you can do is to compute uh, uh, the quasi-particle correction for a point that is, uh, let's say, cl relatively close to the, the, the real band edge as predicted by Koneshan. And then you can use interpolation techniques to have a, a, a better estimate for the position of the, 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 the band edges. Um, another point that I would like to make is that by default, the uh, ability uses uh, the conjugate uh, gradient eigenvalue solver that is very robust, but on the other hand, has limited the MPI scalability because you cannot use more than this number of MPI cores where this NKPT is the number of points in the ABG and this is the number of independent spin polarizations. So if you have a large system, a lot of bands, or you want to use more cores than the number of K points, I strongly suggest you to use the log PCG eigenvalue solver. In a nutshell, you just set parallel KGB to uh, one in the input file. And the reason why I'm suggesting to use this different method is because it has much better uh, scalability at different levels. Uh, you can parallelize over K points, bands, G vectors, and spins. The price to pay is that you have to configure the distribution of the workload with these variables. Uh, where NP stands number of processors, and then you have the different level key point band FFT, and this is the number of bands treated by each processor. Uh, all the, well, the memory scales with all the levels. And if you don't feel comfortable in uh, uh, using all these variables, because it requires some understanding of the internal implementation, you can set auto parallel to one in the input file. In this case, you just define the number of MPI cores you want to use for your calculation, 
and adding it will try to find a good distribution at runtime. There are also a couple of points that is worth stressing here because if you use autoparallel, obviously uh, everything is done automatically, but you should try to help having it find a good uh, configuration. So when you have a spin polarized system, uh, I suggest to use an even number of processors. Uh, in principle, uh, you should use a number of processors that is a multiple of NKPT times NSP poll. There are also, uh, let's say, other constraints on the value of NP band because NP band should be divided uh, uh, band. Okay, so take this into uh, account when uh, preparing your uh, your input file for the generation of the non-circuit system. Okay, so now let's continue with the discussion on uh, uh, the computation of the polarizability in the RT approximation. According to Eden, this is the full uh, expression. So the, the irreducible polarizability is given by G times G, and then here we have the vertex correction. In the RPA, we uh, approximate the vertex with the delta function, and here we have the bubble diagram. Uh, this is the expression for the RPA polarizability if you work in a real space and the frequency domain. If we have the product in the time domain, this becomes a convolution. Now, we usually uh, reformulate this integral by using the Lehman representation for the time order the Green's function. In this case, we have the representation for the Konesham uh, mean field uh, G node. Uh, where uh, mu is the chemical potential and the eta is a positive infinitesimal. In a bit, we call it z cut, there's the default value. Now, if you take the lemma representation, you replace this expression in this integral and you do the math to compute the uh, frequency integral, you end up with the so called Adler Weiser expression that was originally derived in terms of time, time dependent perturbation theory. We don't use this expression directly because it's given in real space. So this means that we have to take this expression and transform the Fourier space using the equations I've discussed in the previous slide. And the final result is given here. As I've already mentioned that since we are dealing with two point functions in Fourier space, we have a matrix that depends on two plane wave indices and a, a, a Q point. Now, there are some parameters that are fixed. In particular, you cannot change the k-point sampling because it's automatically inherited from the wave function file. But at the level of the screening calculation, you can define the cutoff energy for the plane wave expansion and the number of frequencies you want to compute. By default, we compute just two uh, frequencies because this is enough for the plasma pole approximation. Uh, the the z-cut uh, infinitesimal um, broadening is given here. Uh, note that we have the sum over all the possible transition between the conduction and balance. So this is an expression that you get for a semiconductor with time reversal symmetry. And in the numerator, we have these matrix elements, M. These are the so-called oscillator matrix elements that are essentially the uh, matrix elements of the plane wave uh, sandwiched with the two block states. So again, we have the product in real space between two wave functions and we have to deal with the convolution uh, problem. So in principle, the cutoff energy for the oscillator matrix elements uh, is uh, four times the cutoff energy for the wave functions. But we will see that in practical applications, we can reduce this cutoff energy uh, a lot. Uh, here I'm giving an example for an input file for uh, a screening calculation for the plasma pole. Uh, please note that the default value for GW calc type is zero. So in this case, we are preparing uh, the screening for a one shot calculation. We are just computing two frequencies, uh, the static value and another frequency along the imaginary axis given by this variable. And if you don't specify, there's a default behavior. Uh, I mean, it will compute the true plasma frequency from the number of valence electrons, and it automatically sets this parameter and computes the RPA polarizability at this imaginary frequency. And then defines the number of states in the sum over transitions. So you should perform a convergence with respect to the number of states in the RPA sum and the number of plane waves used to build this chi GG prime matrix. Note that these parameters are coupled. 
And this is uh, clearly shown in this slide in which I, is there any question? Okay. So this is clearly shown in this slide in which I showed a convergence study for, uh, well, the uh, direct gap in uh, um, uh, gold, the function of the K-point sampling. Uh, here on the, uh, the x-axis gives the cutoff energy in electron volt, and then you have the number of bands. It's important to note that when you are um, computing magnetic elements with large G or G prime, then you get contribution from high energy uh, states. So this means that you cannot perform a convergence study by just fixing one parameter, KTPS, and then increasing the other one, because uh, values of the magnetic elements at large cutoff energy uh, are also important for the computation of the self energy. And in principle, you should perform a two dimensional convergence study. Uh, fortunately, uh, the, the convergence with respect to N band and EKTPS is partially decoupled from the convergence with respect to the Brillouin zone sampling. What do I mean here? Is that you can, uh, let's say, use a reasonably coarse K mesh to converge this uh, um, cross convergence study. Uh, and then once you find a good value for it and then the, in the KTPS, then you can fix these parameters and you can start to increase the K-point assembly. Note that uh, roughly speaking, uh, GW calculation scales with the, the, uh, um, and the number of K-points in the full green zone squared. So it's very important to perform this expensive convergence study with a relatively coarse K-mesh and then move to something that is much denser. Uh, a couple of uh, uh, comments uh, related to symmetries, uh, because all the uh, two point wave functions are invariant under the action of one of the symmetry of the space group of the crystal. This is uh, expressed by this equation. If you transform this equation to Fourier space, you obtain this expression that relates the matrix elements at point R cube. R is a, 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 a spatial rotation to the matrix elements at point Q. So in practice, this means that similarly to what, what is done for the wave function, also the polarizability is only needed in the irreducible wedge. Then we can use this uh, equation to reconstruct everything at runtime. Uh, symmetries can also be used for the uh, oscillator matrix elements. Uh, and this means that we don't need to sum over the full Brillouin zone, but we only need a, a transition for a restricted set of K points. Uh, let me discuss now the computation of the screened interaction. Uh, according to Eden, uh, w fulfills this Dyson-like uh, equation, matrix notation, that you can alternatively uh, rewrite in this form in which I have introduced the inverse dielectric matrix epsilon minus one. And epsilon is related to the uh, irreducible polarizability by this equation uh, in the uh, real space and, and time domain. If you transform this uh, equation to Fourier space, this is what you uh, get where, okay, this quantity is computed in the RPA code, and this is essentially the Fourier transform of the Coulomb interaction that is four pi divided by Q plus G. And this is the quantity, well, epsilon minus one, actually the symmetrized inverse directory matrix. So this is the quantity that we stored in um, the screening file that uh, is uh, the, uh, used as ingredient uh, in the SIMAP code. Uh, and I, I would like to discuss also the behavior of uh, the, the electric matrix in the long wavelength limit, because if you look at the RPA expression, you immediately realize that if you consider the limit for Q tending to, to zero of the so-called head, so the zero, zero component of the wings that are essentially the first row or the first column of the matrix, then these limits uh, are zero. But in epsilon, we have to divide by the Coulomb interaction. So we have Q plus G1, Q plus G2 in the denominator. So we end up with a zero over zero form and we have to compute this limit. This is important for optical properties. It's important, it's possible to show that the limit is finite, but depends on the direction. And in order to compute this limit, we have to analyze the behavior of the oscillator matrix elements. So we expand the, um, uh, the plane wave with the Taylor, we um, have a problem here because we have to compute the matrix elements of the position operator. We have formulate this matrix element in terms of the commutator according to this equation. Now, in our implementation, 
the um, Hamiltonian consists of uh, different blocks. In particular, we have uh, the kinetic energy, uh, T that contributes to the commutator, then a, a local part whose commutator is zero, and finally, we have the non-local part associated with the pseudo-potentials. So I don't want to bother you with all the technical details, but the final expression for the matrix elements in the long wavelength limit is reported here. This term is CPU demanding, but is included by default. Uh, now, it's crucial in the case of optical properties. It's less important for GW calculation in bulk systems, as long as we converge with respect to the uh, K-point sampling, but if you have an, an anisotropic system or a surface, this term can play um, a role. Uh, then, okay, we have discussed the uh, RPA expression, uh, but it's worth mentioning that the computational cost of the adlet weiser equation scales linearly with the number of frequencies you want to compute. So if you want to uh, have the frequency dependence for several frequency points, I suggest you to use the um, Ebert transform that is documented in this lesson. Uh, the idea is very similar to what is done for optical properties. So you compute the imaginary part in which you have this delta function, so the calculation is very fast. And once you have the imaginary part, then you perform an Ebert transform to get the full polarizability. And the big advantage is that the computational cost of this part is almost independent of the number of frequency points uh, that you want to compute in kinos, unlike the uh, otherwise expression in which the computational cost scales in. The downside is that obviously you end up with the big matrix on file, and unfortunately, uh, this matrix is not MPI distributed. So you may be able to compute the polarizability for several frequencies, but then you have to increase a lot the memory at the level of the self-energy calculation because the full screen must be stored in memory. Uh, this is a typical example of input file. If you want to compute chi for several frequencies, so the first part is uh, rather standard. What I would like to stress here is that you have to change the default value of GW type and set it to two because this corresponds to the contour deformation. By default, we compute the, the polarizability just for two frequencies. Then you have these variables that define the uh, frequency mesh along the real axis and the imaginary axis. And the last two variables activate uh, the Hilbert transform. So one to enter the, the, this particular section of the code. And then uh, this value here defines the number of frequency points in the spectral function, the, the number of omega prime points. Um, Okay, so we have discussed the, the um, computation of the polarizability, and now I would like to address the evaluation of the uh, GW self-energy. Um, this topic was already discussed by Matteo, so I will go quickly through it. We, informally, the GW self-energy is defined by this equation, so it uh, allows us to connect the interacting G to the Koenig-Sham or the mean field uh, G node. This equation can be alternatively rewritten in terms of uh, standard Dyson uh, form. Now, it's important to note that we don't solve this Dyson equation directly. In principle, you can, but it would be extremely uh, expensive. Uh, we solve a slightly different equation that is obtained from the Dyson equation, assuming that there's a well-defined quasi-particle uh, P. This equation is the so-called quasi-particle uh, problem and is given by this equation. So we have the first term in which we have a local potential, uh, including the RT part. What is interesting is the second part in which we have the self-energy in, in integral over a uh, real space. But what is really interesting is the fact that uh, the quasi-particle energy appears on both sides of this uh, equation. So this is not a standard eigenvalue problem. This is a non-linear problem because you have to find a quasi-particle equation for which you can find a normalizable uh, quasi-particle amplitude. And if you're able to solve this problem, then the real part gives you the, uh, the energy of the excitation. The imaginary part is related to the lifetime. But please note that we are just considering the lifetime due to electron-electron interaction. In real materials, there are other physical effects due to phonons, impurities, and effects that contribute to the lifetime. Now, how do we solve this quasi-particle equation? Because I told you that it's not a standard uh, eigenvalue problem, but it's very similar to the Koenig-Sham. And here I'm comparing the two e equations. Uh, 
As you can see, the main difference between Kronesham and quasi-particle is that, okay, the self-energy part is replaced by Xe and there's no frequency dependence. This is a, a non-self-consistent eigenvalue problem. Now, if we assume that the quasi-particle amplitudes uh, are equal to the Kronesham wave functions, we can subtract these two terms uh, and what we obtain is that the quasi-particle energy is given by this nonlinear equation in which we only need to evaluate the Konishama uh, um, uh, wave functions and take the sandwich with the self-energy. We still have a nonlinear eigenvalue problem because the quasi-particle energy appears on both uh, sides of the equation, but if we assume that the quasi-particle energy is can be considered as a small correction to the Konesham, we can linearize the, the frequency dependence of the self-energy. So we use a standard Taylor expansion around the Konesham energy, in which we have to compute the derivative with respect to the frequency. And if we introduce the so-called renormalization factor given by this equation, we obtain a closed expression for the quasi-particle energy. The, uh, that is essentially the Konesham plus a correction term in which we only need to evaluate the matrix elements of the self-energy at the Konesham again value. And this is something that we already know. And then we have to take, uh, uh, let's say also another contribution coming from the matrix elements of the exchange correlation potential. So this simplifies uh, significantly the problem. Uh, and this is the approach that is used uh, in, um, in, let's say many, many uh, implementations. Now, how do we compute the self-energy? Uh, in the frequency space, sigma is given by the convolution between the Green's function and W. Now, we usually rewrite the uh, screen interaction as uh, the bare Coulomb term plus a, 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 another uh, contribution that involves the difference between epsilon minus one and the identity matrix. And this is what is called the correlated part of the screen interaction. The advantage of using this, uh, uh, let's say, expression is that at this point, the self-energy uh, can be split in two, two terms. The first one is the exchange part that is static and the emission and corresponds to the FOC operator, although it's evaluated with Konesham orbitals. And the second part is the correlated contribution that is non-emission, so this is responsible for the imaginary part of the quasi-particle energy and is also frequency dependent. Uh, the other advantage is that most of the long range interaction has been moved to the exchange part. So we have to use a much larger plane wave expansion to converge the exchange part. The correlated uh, contribution requires less plane waves, but on the other hand, we have to deal with the, the, the frequency dependence. Now, uh, I would like to stress that the code does not evaluate the full self-energy operator. This will be extremely expensive. We only compute the matrix elements of the self-energy for particular uh, uh, for a particular subset of Konesham states and for particular frequencies, depending on the application. In the case of one shot, you, we only need the diagonal terms. And there are two different methods that you can use to specify the set of k-points and bands where you want to compute the self-energy. You can use an explicit approach in which you specify the number of k-points, the k-points reduce coordinates, and the, 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 the range of bands for each k-point. Or alternatively, you can tell Abinit to uh, determine automatically the k-points, depending whether you are interested in the fundamental or the optical gap, or you want to have some states be, below and above the Fermi level. Note that when I talk about fundamental and optical gap, I refer to what Abinit sees in terms of uh, um, k-points. Uh, because the k-mesh is fixed, so when we, 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 we say, okay, this is the band edge, this is the band edge on that particular k-mesh. But obviously, if you densify or if you shift, you may find a different value and you, you may find the correct one. So that's the reason why I was suggesting to always look at the Konishan band structure to know where the band edges are, are located. Um, then I would like to discuss the expression used to compute the exchange part. Okay, this is the FOC operator. Uh, this is the Bell Coulomb interaction, and as you can see, we have to sum over the full brilliant zone, but as concerned the number of bands, only the occupied states are involved. If you start from this equation, you transform to Fourier space, and then you take the matrix elements between Konishan orbitals, 
you obtain this expression, in which again, you cannot change the key point sending. This comes from the with function. You can play with, you cannot play with the number of bands because this is fixed by your system, but you can play with the number of plane waves here in this sum. And this is called a cat sigma x in the code. Now it's important to note that since the Coulomb interaction is long range, the cat sigma x uh, is much larger than the cutoff energy used for the wave function. There's another important point worth considering here because if you look at the limit for Q tending to zero and uh, the G equal to gamma, then this term diverges and this uh, high hinders the convergence with respect to the uh, Q point center. Now, the, there are different techniques that are available in the code to integrate this uh, singularity. In the simplest case, uh, you use a spherical integration method uh, in the sense that you approximate the mini box around the gamma with a sphere, and then you perform the, um, the, the integral uh, analytically. This was the legacy uh, approach. At present, we use the method proposed in this uh, paper, uh, then we can find, uh, let's say, the reference on the BIT website, in which we introduce a, 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 an auxiliary function that diverges as the Coulomb part from the long wavelength limit, and we either remove this part, uh, the, um, we can integrate analytically f in the brilliant zone, so at the end of the day, we have to compute numerically uh, the integral of the difference between uh, a divergent part coming from the exchange, the FOC operator, the uh, axillary function, but this is moved because they diverge at the same rate and the convergence is much better. So this is the default value, but there are other techniques based on Monte Carlo methods that can be activated with this value, and they usually perform better than the, the default, although they, they require additional computations and they are a little bit slower. So now I would like to discuss the computation of the correlated part of the self energy. Here, the math is much more uh, complex because we are dealing with the frequency dependent part. So just to summarize the main uh, ideas, the main results, we have a double sum of uh, brain waves. This is defined by the uh, value of ETA-TPS for the screening that you can change in the, the, the sigma part. We have the oscillator matrix elements here that we have already introduced. And uh, last but not least, this J integral uh, essentially comes from the evaluation of the convolution along the real axis. So you get different expressions depending whether you are using the plasma pole point of deformation or, point or the uh, analytic continuation. The parameters that you can change at this level are KTPS and uh, M band for a given integration technique. Note also that uh, gaps, quasi-particle energy differences are much easier to converge than the absolute values. Um, okay, so as I mentioned, uh, the self-energy is given by a convolution in frequency space. We have this J integral, and in the next slides, I'm gonna discuss in more detail the evaluation of this uh, uh, integral using uh, the plasma pole model and the contour deformation. Uh, in the plasma pole model, we have an analytic expression for this term. And the, the main idea is essentially uh, to approximate the imaginary part of the inverse matrix, matrix in terms of a delta peak. So there are only two parameters, the amplitude of the peak and the position that corresponds to the plasma frequency. From this expression for the imaginary part, you obtain the, by, by a Kramer scroning, uh, the real part in which these two parameters are essentially related to the initial uh, parameters of the plasma pole technique. And these quantities, A and omega, are a fit in order to reproduce ab initial results. You can change the model using this uh, input variable. The default is Gosling its plasma pole, but by construction uh, reproduces the, the ab initial epsilon minus one at the, for the static limit and another point around the imaginary axis. Uh, that by default is set to the root plasma frequency. Um, what are the advantages of the plasma pool? Uh, well, first of all, it's very fast and efficient because we get an analytic expression. Um, so it's the ideal tool for the initial, initial convergence studies. And experience has shown that usually this approximation gives accurate results for the quasi-particle energies around the Fermi level. 
the problem is that it's questionable when you have systems in which the imaginary part has additional um, peaks. Um, uh, you cannot compute the imaginary part. Uh, you cannot uh, have access to the electron lifetimes and the spectral functions. And moreover, the quasi-particle corrections are qualitatively wrong if you uh, start to look at um, corrections far from the Fermi level. And this is clearly shown in this picture, which we have the real part of the self-energy for aluminum obtained with the plasma pole or with the contour deformation. This is the Fermi level. And as you can see, in this region, the plasma pole uh, works well. But if we start to look at uh, low uh, energy or high energy states, uh, then the, the behavior we obtain with the plasma ball uh, is physically uh, wrong. So I would not suggest to use this approach if you're interested in bandwidth methods or if you want to do some kind of set consistency in which you have to include uh, states far from the Fermi level. Uh, this is a typical input file we use to compute uh, self-energy metric elements with the plasma ball. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, we use these variables to read the wave function file, the screening. This is the cutoff energy that is usually fixed uh, uh, for all the levels of the, the, the GW calculation, is the cutoff energy for the wave functions. Uh, this is the uh, ECATPS defines the number of plane waves that will be used to, to describe the screening. Uh, and uh, uh, this value can be set to something smaller than the one we use to generate the high knot matrix in the screening part. So you, first, you generate the big matrix in the screening code, and then you read the sub matrix in the cinema part to perform all your convergent studies. And then we have okay the, 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 the cutoff energy for the exchange part, something that you can change. Although mathematically, we know that the, the, there's a maximum value that is essentially four times the cutoff energy for the wave functions. This is the number of bands in the green function. This should be subject to convergent study, and here we specify. Uh, the, the, the key point where we want to compute the um, self-energy corrections and the range for, for, for the bands. Uh, okay, so if we want to go beyond the plasma pole approximation, we have to compute the frequency dependence of the screen interaction. The problem is that uh, both G and W have poles uh, along the real axis. So if you want to compute the numerically the integral, uh, for the self-energy, we really need a lot of frequency points because we have a, a lot of sharper oscillations when we move along the real axis. So in the contour deformation technique, the main idea is to use Cauchy's um, integration theorem and this red contour. Uh, so we know from complex calculus that if you integrate G times W along this uh, red path, then the, the, this, this integral is equal to the sum of the residues in lying inside the contour. So in other words, using the, these results from complex analysis, we can rewrite the integral along the real axis as an integral along the imaginary axis that requires less frequencies to converge because we are far from the poles. And then we have an additional contribution coming from the poles of the integrand function, but we know where these poles are located, so we can compute these sum over poles uh, automatically. And this means that we don't need to sample uh, the polarizability up to infinity. We need a few frequencies along the imaginary axis and uh, uh, let's say around 50 or 100 uh, real frequencies to uh, evaluate this additional sum. This method is much more accurate than plasma pole. The problem is that it requires uh, uh, more memory and it's also more uh, expensive. Note that if you want to use this method, you should use GW calc type 2, both in the screening and in the, in the cinema uh, input file. Um, OK, so this is just um, a slide showing how to compute the spectral function. This is the, the definition of the spectral function in terms of the interacting G. And then uh, you can reformulate everything in terms of the self-energy according to this expression. And uh, there are two variables um, that can be used to govern the evaluation of this equation, the number of points for the spectral function and the maximum real frequency. So I, I don't discuss the, this part in detail, but uh, everything is uh, analyzed in the, the second GW lesson. And there are also post-processing tools uh, that allow you to, to plot the spectral function from uh, the, the NetCDF files. Uh, 
Um, okay, so this completes uh, the, the discussion related to the GW implementation, the different variables that are available. And I would like to uh, discuss other technical aspects related to the use of the uh, uh, pseudonym conserving pseudo potentials, in particular in connection with the GW calculation. So we don't have enough time to discuss pseudo potential theory. So I, I, in this slide, I'm trying to summarize the most important concepts. The pseudo potential is essentially an operator that allows us to describe uh, the exchange correlation interaction between the valence electrons that are included explicitly in the calculation and core electrons that are uh, frozen and uh, uh, say imported from the atomic environment. By construction of the pseudo potential, we can reproduce the atomic energies and the balance wave function outside a certain uh, pseudization radius. Now, from the point of view of the implementation, pseudo potentials are extremely important, especially if you use plane waves, because the pseudized balance uh, wave function are much easier to describe in terms of. Uh, uh, Fourier uh, components. We also decrease significantly the number of uh, uh, electrons that must be uh, treated. Unfortunately, the pseudo potential has some drawback because we cannot reproduce the nodal shape of the all electron wave functions around the nuclei, and we cannot take into account uh, the relaxation of the core because we use the frozen core approximation, so we import the core from the atomic environment. This is true for ground state application, but there are so other points that is worth discussing when you use pseudo potentials for GW, because strictly speaking, what we are computing is the balance part of the self energy. So there are additional terms coming from the core that are essentially treated at the corner sham level and imported from the atomic environment. Now, this does not mean that you cannot use pseudo potential to perform GW, but that you should use pseudo potentials that are explicitly generated, keeping GW applications in mind. In particular, the matrix elements of the FOC operator are very sensitive to the nodal shape of the orbitals. So when you have um, um, battle wave functions that overlap in space in, uh, for a particular element, then all these states should be treated as balanced. And this is clearly seen here, in which I'm showing a pseudo potential for gallium, in which I only included the 3D state as balance, the blue curve here. In this figure, I show the uh, same element, but now I'm also treating the 3S and the, the 3P states. This is the black curve here and the red curve here. You see these peaks that have a significant overlap with the, the 3D. So this means that this particular pseudo potential should not be used for GW calculation because if you look at the correction for the D states, obviously they interact with the 3S and 3P at the level of the exchange part, and you really need to have these um, electrons treated as balance. Moreover, uh, in the, our implementation, uh, we used uh, lemma representation to express the Green's function as a sum over empty states. So this means that you need good scattering properties in the uh, empty region. What do, we, do I mean with the um, good scattering properties? The pseudo potential should reproduce the scattering properties of the all electron atom. And in particular, you should not have those states. You should not have the spurious uh, resonances in the high energy uh, region. And uh, as you can see, this pseudo has a very bad logarithmic derivative at high energy, whereas this other version that includes a uh, semi-core state has much better scattering properties. So we are confident that when you generate a function file with uh, empty states, uh, uh, the, the results are physically correct. Uh, now I would like to mention uh, briefly the Pseudo-Dojo project because we have been working on uh, these tables of non-conserving pseudo-potentials. Uh, and we also try to generate uh, pseudos that can be used for, for GW calculation. So all the pseudos are available at this uh, URL. We provide pseudos for non-conserving, PW. There are different functionals, uh, version of scal for uh, scalar relativistic calculation or uh, fully relativistic, uh, including spin-orbit coupling. Uh, we provide two different tables, uh, standard and stringent. Standard um, is supposed to perform well for uh, ground state or the FPT application. Whereas for uh, GW application, we recommend stringent version, which we have more valence electrons uh, 
and good scattering properties in the empty region. Um, then, uh, yes, what I would like to mention is that all the pseudos have been validated by comparing with all electrical results, and there are also hints for the cutoff energy. As you can see here, we have this hint with the low accuracy, and then the, the one that we, before we suggest for normal application, and then the, the cutoff energy for high accuracy in uh, convergence studies. So you can use these values uh, as a starting point for uh, your uh, analysis. The last topic uh, I would like to discuss is how to compute GW band structures, because as already mentioned, you can only compute the matrix elements of the self-energy for K points in the wave function file. So you cannot obtain easily the uh, quasi particle band structure along an asymmetry a path. You need to use some sort of interpolation technique. There are three methods that are available. The first one is rather crude and essentially consists in fitting the quasi particle correction as a function of the Cone Sharma energy. There's an ABPI example, but we don't use this approach uh, very often. The second method is based on maximally localized Vanier function, so it requires the Vanier package. There's an example available in the test suite, and I refer um, to this paper for additional details. So this approach is very accurate. The price to pay is that you have to uh, generate maximally localized by the function. Yeah? So that's the reason why we usually start from something that is simpler and is based on the star function interpolation. That is um, um, the same method that is used in the bootstrap uh, uh, code to interpolate functions uh, that uh, <coughs> have some kind of periodicity in the in the building zone. Uh, this method is less accurate than interpolation. There are possible problems in the case of band crossings, but it's relatively easy to um, implement. Um, and indeed, in the next slide, uh, I, um, I'm showing how to use uh, uh, Abitai uh, to obtain the, um, inter an interpolated band structure. Um, so the basic uh, um, workflow proceeds as follows. So first of all, you compute the Kahn-Sham band structure along a high symmetry K path. This is important because in the star function interpolation, there are two possible approaches. Either you use, either you interpolate the, the, the quasi-particle energies, or you just interpolate the correction. So the difference between quasi-particle and Kahn-Sham. Interpolating the correction makes the algorithm much more robust because the corrections are smoother uh, when compared, much smoother when compared to the quasi-particle energy. So that's the reason why in the first step, we compute the Kronenstein band structure because we are gonna apply the correction on top of these uh, Kronenstein results. Once you have the band structure in Kronenstein formalism, then you run the GW calculation the price to pay is that you have to compute the correction for all the key points in the irreducible band wedge and all the bands that you want to have in the final band structure plot. And once you have uh, the Connisham results and the GW stored in uh, uh, CPRS and the GSR file respectively, then you can use ABIPI, and this is an example uh, from the ABIPI documentation to read the, uh, all the quantities. Uh, call the interpolation routine based on start function. There's only one parameter, but we, we provide the default values that work in the majority of the cases. And once you have performed this interpolation, you apply the correction on top of the Connection and structure, and you can compare, for example, the LDA results with the, the, the GW ones. Okay, so this completes uh, my talk on the on GW calculations in practice. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention. And uh, uh, yeah. if you have questions, then we can start a discussion about these technical uh, aspects of the uh, GW code. Um, how do we make question? Just talk. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you just mention some words on? The algorithms that are used in all the structure of Abinitio. In all the structure of Abinit, the program. So we saw how to use the parameters. We, but I would like to expand a bit more on which are the algorithms used to solve the equations. Which equations? Because I mean, you know, we've seen Abinit for DFT, 
And now this is in the in GW, GW. Sorry, but I, I didn't get the, your, your, your question. What kind of algorithm can, can you give me an explicit example? Are you, are you interested in the polarizability or the self energy or? Yeah, okay. To be more precise and connecting to the previous lecture, uh, we know that solving Eddie's equation, even in the GW approximation, is very difficult. Um, what all these many body codes do is solve them and get the GW approximation. That's not true, but uh, okay. I mean, I think that we explained that we do perturbation theory. So we're not solving at the equation. There's very few codes that actually do solve the, the equation. Okay. Okay. So this is why I'm saying that this is not true. There's very few codes that do that. Yes, you, you can do that, but this requires uh, expressing uh, the Green's function uh, in a uh, space or Fourier space as big matrices. Uh, and as already mentioned, one of the big bottlenecks or limitation we have in the present implementation is that not all the data structure, not all the arrays are MPI distributed. So that, that's the reason why we only focus on particular metric elements. We just compute the metric elements of the self energy in the block, uh, in the Konishan representation. We don't construct the full Green's function of the full self energy. Matteo, can, can, Matteo, can you show the, what is actually done? I mean, the, the correction that we're computing. <clears throat> yeah, this is exactly what we do. Okay, so th this is really important. Okay, so what we're doing is the first equation at the top. Here. We're not solving for the uh, Eddings equation. Okay? okay, okay. So now, can you make your question? This equation is solved. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. As you can see here, we only compute these matrix elements, actually only the diagonal terms if you are in one shot mode. And all these equations are here just to tell you how we compute these matrix elements in Fourier space. You see? We have the little matrix elements, the, the, the sandwich of the plane wave it could be between two Konishan orbitals. Once you have the oscillator matrix elements, you divide it by Q plus G squared, and you sum over G vectors, Q points, uh, occupied states. And at the end of the day, you get the matrix elements of the FOC operator uh, between, uh, well, the diagonal matrix elements with the B1 and the KT, the web vector. And then you have the correlation part. This is the way we compute it. Everything is done on the fly by just uh, summing over all these terms. If you can. Just a second. If you can put again the first equation that's you know the one of the correction there. No, the one of the correction. I mean this, yeah, this is really what we're doing. Okay, so we you know the VXC, you get it from the FT, you basically remove that and you add the, the self-energy, and the self-energy is decomposed as just what they was showing into the exchange bar in the position. Okay, and this is where the quasi particle cell consistency that Matteo was mentioning is. I mean, this is an approximation. It's the first order perturbation theory because you have the, the wave function that are the cone sham uh, uh, eigen function there. So you're you're assuming that the, the cone sham eigen functions are close to the actual quasi particle wave function. Okay, and if you want to do quasi particle self consistent, what you do is that you iterate there and you compute, you diagonalize. You obtain new eigenvalues, new wave functions, put them back into that, and then you iterate yeah. again. And self consistent. Yeah. Okay. okay. So there was a question there, and then we'll. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, firstly, regarding pseudo potentials, because some codes like VASP can perform GW calculation using PAW pseudo potentials. So I was wondering in this case, which is which makes the calculations unstable. <laughs> the second question is that if well, it's possible, maybe, maybe we can do one, one question at okay. a time, okay? I'm <laughs> <laughs> not sure that we understood what you mean. Because uh, Matteo said that by using Abinit, it's better to use more conservative set of potentials instead of PAW. I was wondering there which is the, the problem. Okay, it's not a problem with instability. I, mean, I can answer, Matteo, if you want. Huh? But, <laughs> so uh, it's not a problem of instability. There's a paper that has been published by the authors of BASP, okay? That if you want to use PAW, mm -hmm. you need to have non-conserving like PAW. So you need to have 
special pseudopotentials because this conservation of the so basically we have an implementation of PAW in Abit and it works okay but if you need something that needs to be precise then you have a problem because we don't have the pseudos that are serving like in PAW formats. Okay. I don't know if you want to add something, Matteo. Uh, yeah, well, just to say that there are some basic assumptions uh, in the PW method uh, related to the completeness uh, of the basis set inside the PW sphere. These assumptions usually uh, are fulfilled, are usually fulfilled in the case of ground state calculation. But then when you go to GW, things become much more complex. Uh, your basis set may not be complete enough or you may have numerical instabilities. And that's the reason why the, the VASP group tried to bypass or address this problem by generating non-conserving like. And besides, they sometimes include semicolor states, uh, uh, similar to what is done in the, uh, the pseudo-dodger table. So you may have, even in PW, you may have a pseudo-potential that works well for GW, but doesn't work very well or doesn't give very accurate results at the level of the PW part. Because also in PW, you have this problem. I mean, if you generate a PW pseudo with just 3D, again, you're going to have problems in the exchange part because 3D overlaps with 3S and 3P. Not all the PW pseudo in BASP uh, have all the semicolor states. They do not, do not close the end shell. For efficiency reason, because you have less electrons in the ground state part of monocular dynamics. The second question? Yes, uh, I was wondering if uh, it's feasible and particularly if, again, it's stable to use uh, as a starting point wave function calculated by using hybrid functionals and then applying GW on top of that. It, that there's nothing that prevents that. Is, is, is but that I've read that, um, for example, I'm using Yambo and they said that it's very unstable applying GW on top of that. So I was wondering if with Abinit, it's... More stable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know, that's maybe related to how you remove the exchange correlation part then. Mm -hmm. This is a bit more... I don't know, Matteo, do you, you have a comment about that? Why it would be less stable? I mean, one way I could see it in a minute to do that, okay? Sorry? One way that I could see how to do it in a minute in a reasonable way, I would say. Because in the GW part, you could replace, and it's actually possible to replace the self energy operator by an hybrid functional. Mm -hmm. You can treat the hybrid functional as a perturbation on top of your PBE. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, I mean, and then you do a quasi particle set consistent, for instance, calculation there. I don't see any reason why you shouldn't, after a while, just switch to another self-energy operator and go ahead with that. No, but I mean, I think, I think the question was, uh, uh, young would they advise uh, to pay attention because uh, I believe needs uh, a forest of uh, many, many functionals and uh, some of them will be very far from the quasi-particle uh, situation. Yeah, but it so could be... you start from uh, no, a very strong could... starting point. No, but I'm not speaking... I mean, she, uh, she didn't ask about the quasi-particle. I mentioned the quasi-particle, but if you start from an hybrid, you could do G0, W0 on top of an hybrid. Huh? Yeah, but if the hybrid, let's say, uh, this approach is a perturbative approach. Yeah. So you should start from its zero, which is close to the final situation. If you pick up uh, an hybrid, which is very, very far away. I don't know. It's, uh, it's a yeah, forest so, of hybrids. I mean, you can be wrong. What you're saying is that you yeah, could be wrong. Yeah. I mean, she's speaking about instability. Yeah, instability of into this sense. Imagine. That's so, compare also to the computation of empty states with hybrids. Yeah. But I have to say that the majority of uh, GW calculation on top of hybrids are usually done with BASC. Uh, or perhaps the, in BASC they have. Uh, algorithms that are able to converge high energy states. I, I don't know how the, the hybrids are treated in quantum espresso, or perhaps if you use iterative algorithms, they will have problems in the high energy region. I know that in BASP they have, they use direct diagonalization techniques that could be interesting for hybrids and perhaps they are more stable, but it depends on the internal implementation. It would be useful to discuss with the 
last period in quantum espresso developers to understand how do they deal with the, 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 the computation of empty states with hybrids. Okay, for the exchange part, the self energy operator, can you go back to the equation? For the self, uh, for the exchange part, can you go back to the, the slide? Here you are summing over only the occupied states, but for the um, for the correlation part, you are so uh, you are summing over all states. Yeah, yeah, I was just wondering how, like, why is it only for the exchange part you are only summing over the occupied, but for the correlation part you are summing over everything. Uh, this depends on the poles uh, because well, you, you have to go through the math in particular what you have to do. You have to start from this equation, then you use the lemon representation that gives you the frequency dependence. And now in W, you have this part that is static. Uh, this is the part that the leads to the exchange part. And you can show that when you use V inside of this expression for the self energy, um, some contributions are automatically zero. In particular, the contribution coming from the empty state because you can close the contour and there's no pole inside the path. So the integral is zero. Only occupied states contribute to the convolution for, for the exchange part. It's, it's a bare exchange, right, Matteo? Yeah, that's the bare exchange. This is the bare Coulomb term. You can relate that to R3 fog also. Huh? Fog, you're not using uh, the, the unoccupied state. Yeah. Everything comes from uh, well, this definition, and you have to do the, the integrals you know, in frequency space and use complex analysis uh, to evaluate these integrals. Some of these integrals are zero. In particular, for the exchange part, all the contribution coming from MTV bands are zero. And that's the reason why you get this expression here. For the correlated part, unfortunately, <laughs> the integral is zero. This is the expression for the correlated part. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For the correlated part, you are summing over the occupied states, but for the exchange part, you are summing over all the states. Yeah. 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 You end up with, the, with all the states in the element representation. In the correlation part, there is the screen exchange part that's in there, huh? in the correlation part. Yeah, because you have the frequency dependence that obviously must be taken into account when you compute the frequency, the, the, the convolution, whereas V is static. Yes. Just, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, just a question about parallelization in. in GW. So, do you have any recommendation for, uh, for example, for the levels of parallelization, like uh, for the K points, for the, um, I mean, for the, especially for the MBI? And uh, a second quick question is regarding uh, a GBU. Do you have a plan to, to apply GBU since it's uh, extensive, uh, uh, extensively expensive calculation? Okay, so as concerns the uh, parallelism, there's a tutorial. Uh, let me find a slide. Uh, no, uh, okay, it's in the beginning. Let me okay. mention that you should try to first use the most obvious parallelization as possible. So for the screening, the most obvious one is on the cue point. So. Oh. No, it depends. It's not, it's, not done, it's not done automatically. Everything is explained here. We have uh, one level of parallelism that is over bands because it allows us to uh, well, distribute the wave functions. So, so the, the good news is that everything is done automatically. Okay, in principle, the number of process, the maximum number of processors is defined by the number of bands. You can use more than the number of more processors than the number of bands, but in this case, we start to distribute the transitions. So in this regime, I don't feel that the, the scaling is very good. Uh, for te additional technical details, I, I, refer, uh, I, refer to you, I refer you to this, uh, this tutorial. Uh, usually you try to use the number of MPI cores that divides the number of bands, okay? Then uh, it's true that we have additional levels of parallelism. In particular, you can split the, the cue points. And you can run uh, independent screening calculation with all the cue points. Yeah? And actually, we have a post-processing tool called the merge screening that allows you to merge all these partial screening files, similarly to what is done with the, the, uh, the, the dynamical metrics. So, but um, uh, it's uh, rather cumbersome if you have to merge all this stuff manually. And 
when, when we use this technique is because we use a DPI to automate the calculation. So the, the main message is that uh, the code has good scalability. Uh, the main issue is the memory requirement because as I already mentioned several times, not all the arrays scale, the, not all the arrays are MPI distributed, in particular the screening. So the polarizability usually uh, it's a bottleneck, but it scales well. You may generate uh, gigabytes of screening file, but then you have to read them, you read this file in the Sigma part, and here you can go out of memory. And uh, even increasing the number of processors won't solve the problem because the array is not distributed. Now I go back to your second question related to GPUs. The big problem in GW calculation with plane waves is that we have to deal with two point functions and a lot of memory. So from our perspective, uh, GPUs, uh, well, are interesting if you want to accelerate the CPU bound part, but GPUs do not have the same memory available on the nodes. Uh, so we haven't uh, worked on uh, a possible integration uh, of the GW code with the GPUs because first of all, we have to address the problem related to memory. And actually we are considering uh, re-implementing, <laughs> let's say GW algorithms almost from scratch, but usually using a different approach that is supposed to scale better. And then once you have this new algorithm then we, that is able to distribute memory, then we can start to think about GPUs because on the GPU, usually we have less memory than on the CPU part. And there was a talk, at, I couldn't attend it, but I think there was a talk by Mauro Del Ben at the March meeting about uh, uh, porting uh, Burke GW and, uh, you can have a look. Thank you. Other questions? There is an online question. Uh, Francesco, should you check it? Okay. So the question is about uh, uh, non diagonal elements of desert energy obtained between G0 and W0. Beyond. Beyond, sorry. Beyond G0 and W0. So he's asking. Uh, in, uh, in which systems these uh, non-diagonal elements are uh, important? Well, I would say that uh, when the initial Hamiltonian at H0 is far from what you would expect, uh, uh, the self-energy is not expected to be diagonal in the Konisham representation. So for, for example, when you have D or F electrons correlated to materials, uh, I would uh, expect the uh, of diagonal terms to play to play a role. Although let's say the, the, the DMFT community uh, usually look at the, uh, this problem from, from, from a different perspective. Uh, well, I, unfortunately I have to say that I don't run so many calculations. I usually focus on the, Software development. So I, I, I don't have. Uh, In the past, people didn't pay attention to that. I mean, they used to just make the assumption, as Valerie was pointing, that indeed the wave functions uh, that you get from uh, some kind of exchange correlation function are close to the quasi particle ones. And then sometimes, you know, the GW didn't work. And so they say, okay, now let's try to go one step beyond. We do one step of self consistency, and you check whether you know the new wave functions are far from from the other ones. And there are cases in which indeed that's the case, and in some other cases not really. So it's hard to say in advance. Yeah, it's hard to say, and those different groups have a different perspective because uh, people will tell you, okay, you need to include vertex corrections. Other yeah. people will say, no, you have to uh, do some kind of self consistency, quasi particle self consistency. Uh, uh, other people, uh, let's say, for example, in another case, we are also looking at the electron phonon contribution. So it's still under debate, huh? still under debate. The question is more, can you know in advance when one would have to put that? If you know the answer about the, on the question when the idea is not good, then that's the... 
But I mean, Valerio, can you know if I give you one material? Can you know in advance? Yes, you have to do that. Yes. Yes, because we know in general when the idea is failing. And okay. the idea I'm going to pick one material by in a random. Is, is, is failing when we are uh, we have localized uh, electrons. <laughs> And the LDA is failing because typically for these localized electrons, the LDA uh, gives the results that is too much delocalized. Mm -hmm. It's out of uh, the self interaction. And uh, this is cured by the exchange, the FOC exchange that localizes. So this happens whenever you have a D and F electron systems, as Matthew said. Um, in particular, when we have DNF electrons uh, that are occupied, because they are more localized than the DF and F electrons that are, are unoccupied. And when you have uh, uh, final systems, because again, in final systems, typically the LDA delocalizes too much degree functions. Now, I'm not an expert for final systems, but again, you may expect that in final systems, the G node, W node is not always good for the degree functions. It's not, this is not a general statement, but it may happen. And um, I have to say that now the GW approximation is starting to be applied to final systems, RPC molecules, and we are finding, people are finding problems also there. And for that, Valerian is the expert. <laughs> <laughs> you can uh, ask you. <laughs> Matteo, yes, I completely agree with your, uh, let's say, analysis. Uh, but uh, um, if you speak with the uh, guys from the DMFT community, they will say, okay, GW is not able to, to, to deal with the DOF electrons and we have to go to DMFT. Or the, I, I even seen, so, um, seen papers in which people were using uh, GW on top of LDA plus U. And actually they proposed to use a GW plus U prime approach, which you don't remove the U completely, but you just remove part of it. <laughs> yeah, discussing about the G not W not uh, implementation of the GW approximation. Then you can have materials where the GW approximation itself is not good. Okay. So, but that's uh, uh, another question. It's possible that the GW approximation is not good because it doesn't capture the physics that you, do, that you need to describe. Uh, the, the, the discussion about the wave functions is just part of the problem because there is also the energy dependence in the self energy, and this also may be important. It may be important if your final uh, GW energy is far from the Kushan energy, and this uh, Matteo has shown when uh, has derived the linearized expression. And this can be the case if you look at semi-core levels, uh, where the GW or core levels, where the GW corrections are big, big in size. Or um, just because the self energy itself has uh, crucial ingredients, this can be a problem. And this can be a problem if you look at spectral functions. So. There are many situations where the GNO W0 breaks down and you have to be careful. This would be a problem of the GNO W0, not a problem of the GW approximation. Yeah. Uh, comparing TFT and GW to compute the band structure of the same system, how much do I increase in my SPU time? Because like, if you tell to a quantum chemist that you want to calculate an absorption spectra of a molecule with 50 atoms using couple cluster, probably they will tell you, yeah, this is not feasible. But what is my limitation regarding the W of system size and of this? I mean, as Matteo mentioned, one of the big limits is the, the memory. But I mean, we have been able to do a, a amorphous system consisting of about 70 atoms without too many problems. And we went up to a BSE, which will be presented 
on Friday. So, but that was a while ago. Was that, that there was that Libor here, uh, Matteo? With David, uh, with David. Yeah. I think that now maybe you can aim to uh, a bit more than hundreds. With the tier tier zero machine, but good computing capabilities. It's a, it's a big machine. Yeah. And actually, I mean, if you look at the code that I was mentioning, Berkeley DW, they can they can even do a larger systems. Yeah, they, they usually use thousands of cores. Yeah? This is something that uh, must be taken into account. So yeah. I, I would say that if you have a tier one machine with, uh, I don't know, 48, 96 uh, cores uh, that you can use uh, easily, uh, you can do calculation with 10 atoms uh, easily. Uh, if you start to look uh, into a system with the 50 atoms, uh, then you, you, you need a tier zero, tier zero machine. But also in this case, it also depends on the accuracy because if you take silicon and you want to do a quantum deformation or perhaps a full self-consistent calculation just for academic purposes, eh? uh, <laughs> you may need <laughs> hundreds of uh, CPUs, of uh, course, easily. And that depends on, so this is about uh, playing with methods, but uh, Valerio is working, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Valeria is working on a code that, that is uh, based on localized data sets. And in that case, you can probably go to a larger system. And, uh, sorry? With, uh, with the code that you are using for GW and Beta Peter, using a localized data set, so you can go to larger systems. So what is the typical size of the system that can be done with uh, that code? Well, I didn't push uh, to, to the extreme. Uh, uh, but uh, they, they told me that uh, it is possible to do clusters of uh, hundreds of atoms, uh, for sure. So several we did, Yeah, several. Mm -hmm. So I did, I did, uh, I did, uh, I did the GW calculation, you know, WM calculation on, on a molecule of uh, 100 atoms, but we can go at least uh, multiply by, by five, even by 10. But I mean, it's a different basic set. It's a different basis set, and in that case, I mean, since it's a molecule, you could not do that with plane waves because uh, in the plane waves, you have to pay for the price of the vehicle. Uh, because uh, uh, Masoud uh, want want to be uh, to okay. No, if you want, if you want to. No, no. I, I just asked if it was finished, and she said yes. So okay. you can go. <laughs> so, so I advise Masoud to unmute his microphone. Because otherwise, I have to. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. First, uh, actually, I asked a question at the very beginning that what is the main difference between RPA? Uh, I mean, uh, the approach that one uses for computing the heart of uh, GW screening. Uh, and uh, other uh, other methods like co six or I don't know so uh, so six or even co uh, to compute this. Uh, I read sometimes people actually fix a screening uh, on co six and do uh, uh, um, um, uh, eigenvalue GW calculation something like this to enhance the uh, self energy pool. Uh, I was wondering. What is the physical uh, meaning difference between RPA and core 6, for example? Oh, wait, because we, now we are talking about two different concepts. Uh, RPA usually refers to the polarizability, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Matteo, but okay. The, you can obtain the screening yeah. with uh, RPA, or you can do core 6 as an approximation. Yeah, but the, the level of the self energy. Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's different. It's G and I and the static limit of W cos x, if I remember correctly. Yeah, cos x is static, yeah. So that it's in the... it's G times W at t equal to zero plus. The static limit. Okay, so, actually, let me uh, let me explain a bit more. Uh, for RPA, as uh, last speaker mentioned, actually, we consider propagation of electron and hole separately. They don't uh, see each other. Uh, but when we say co six, it is an aesthetic approximation. Well, what does it mean? I mean, I cannot make connection between this and uh, the GW uh, uh, dynamic properties. Now, the co six is a static approximation to the self energy. So the, this is the polarizability, and this is the RPA, okay? You and mean 
uh, the polarizability which is computed uh, within GW using core 6 is, uh, is uh, frequency independent. I mean, you don't because compare. For, that's what Mathieu is trying to tell you, is that you go directly to the, to the, to, to the self-energy. You make an approximation for the self-energy that assumes that you, you have a, a static screening. There. You calculate just the frequency equal to zero. Yeah. And you calculate it in the random phase approximation. Okay, so in Cosex, the random phase approximation is the same as in GW. The only difference is that the self-energy, uh, instead of being dynamical, as in GW, becomes static because it's a static approximation to the GW approximation itself. Is that clear? Okay, I got it. And uh, what what's that uh, source X and other uh, things like this, which are, uh, I mean, uh, uh, preferred, I don't know, second order exchange or something like this, I don't know, uh, or... Uh... So it source X goes beyond the, beyond the GW approximation. Uh, so if, uh, Matteo, if you can put the slide in which you you put the, di the Feynman diagram of the, so of the Feynman, this one, for example. So you see that uh, in the GW approximation is an approximation which is, uh, uh, let's say, first order in the screen of approximation W. You can go beyond and consider diagrams with, uh, at the second order, for example, containing two uh, screened interaction W. And, uh, and SOSEX is a kind of second approximation. So it's not exactly a second order full, second order self-energy diagram. There is an approximation more, but you can see it as, a sec as an order factor with respect to the GW self-energy, okay? So why COSEX, you take this diagram, GW, and you, uh, let's say, you, uh, you neglect the omega dependency in W, so, Cos X is at the same order, perturbative order at GW. In Sos X, you go an, an order further. Okay? Okay. We, we uh, don't have a diagram of Sos X here because, okay, we decided to, to keep uh, the, no, not to advanced level, but I mean, if you check in the literature, you can find uh, very easily the, this, uh, this diagram. And you can have. Uh, a physical uh, picture of uh, what is that in so sex. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Other questions? No. It's probably going to be more once you start uh, doing actual calculation. <laughs> so we'll be there this afternoon. Thank you very much, Matteo. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye.